uh, so you can access it in the future if needed. Um, <clears throat> ask everybody uh, if you're if you're not speaking, please keep yourself on mute. Um, uh, questions, please put those in the in the chat box. Uh, we'll ask we'll answer those uh, as we go along or get to them at the end. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, if you have any comments or questions, billysei at gmail.com. Um, sorry, our uh, uh, PDHs for this uh, will be up on our website um, if they're not already directly after this. So you can download um, your PDHs from the sei-philly.org uh, uh, website uh, at any time here. So today uh, we're talking about the CN Rainy Lake Basketball, Brad, Basketball Span uh, Bridge Rebuil Rehabilitation. Um, Speaker is uh, John Eberly um, from uh, from AECOM, senior structural engineer in the AECOM Bridge Department, Bridge Department um, in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, um, and also is the operations manager for AECOM's Movable Bridge practice. Uh, received his bachelor's in civil from Bucknell, uh, and also a master's in civil from Virginia Tech. Uh, and John specifically was the structural task lead. Um, for the rehabilitation design of this bridge. Um, so with that, John, I'd like to hand it over to you to take the screen and walk us through. Okay, great. Thanks, James. And you know, thanks everyone for dialing in today and giving me the opportunity to present on a project that a design, AECOM designed a few years ago. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Get the presentation started and I'll turn my camera off just to save some bandwidth. Great. So hopefully everyone can uh, see the presentation now. I'll take the silent to mean yes. <laughs> um, so again, be talking today about the uh, CN Rainy Lake Bridge. Uh, it's a structure that ACOM did a design for a rehab on uh, a couple of years ago now. So first up, uh, we're going to start off with a project introduction, just introduce you to the, the bridge itself, where it's located, and give you a little background on it. Um, then we'll take a look at the project need, uh, why a rehab was required for this bridge, and then we'll take a look at the rehab design itself, and we'll wrap things up with taking a look at the construction. All right, so first up, project introduction. So this bridge is located right on the Minnesota-Canada border on the Canadian side. Um, so you can see in the zoomed in view there on the left, it's really just a stone throw from the border. Um, it's uh, on a causeway that goes out through. So you can see here, um, this is the CN rail line. Um, that, that's the only thing that's on this causeway. And the bridge itself is circled there um, in blue that you can see. All right, so the bridge itself, it's a Strauss overhead counterweight bascule bridge. Um, go a little bit into the theory of that in the next slide to give you a better understanding of kind of how it works. Um, but the bridge itself was built in 1913, so you know over a hundred year old structure still in service today. Um, it's, it's comprised of two spans. One is a 96 foot bascule span um, in the photo on the right that's on the left side there that opens up. And then it also has a 16 and a half foot approach span. Um, part of that's kind of hidden by the control house that we see here in brown. All right, and then it currently carries a single track. So in the photo here on the left, you can see um, there's the track going across the right side of the bridge. And then on the left behind the handrail there, you can see what looks like some concrete blocks. So the bridge was originally designed to carry two tracks. It did have a second track on it at some point during its history. Um, but at some point, again, that track was taken off. They only needed the one out here, um, and that was replaced with these concrete blocks. And that's just to make sure that the balance of the structure is maintained with a movable bridge. You need to make sure it's in a good balance um, so that you're not overworking the machinery. All right, so a little bit of bridge theory here. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with movable bridges, or at least uh, these Strauss bridges are very unique. Um, so typically, a, you know, a basco bridge is fundamentally a movable structure that opens by rotating about a point um, to open the span up. So this blue bar here on the right, because it's a basco, we know that's going to kind of swing up and out of the way to open the channel for boats. Um, but these Strauss bascules are rather unique in that a typical bascule, the counterweight's fixed directly to the span and it rotates right along with it. 
um, versus this structure, the counterweight actually stays in a vertical orientation as the bridge opens. Um, and there's not one point of rotation, but there's actually four of them. So there's the lower right corner here. That would be the main trunnion. Um, that's one of the fixed points on top of the tower. Again, on the right is the second point of rotation. Again, that's a fixed point because it's connected directly to the tower. And then the two points on the left are the ones that actually move. So um, this is kind of crude because I did it in PowerPoint, but I think it'll give you a rough idea of how this works. So as the bridge opens up, uh, span swings up and out of the way, and then this parallelogram that's comprised of the four points. Um, the two kind of vertical legs stay in the same orientation and the other two swing. So the counterweight again stays vertical and kind of swings down and in as the bridge opens. All right, uh, so vessel traffic, you know, obviously there's boats coming through here. That's why a movable bridge is required. So these are primarily pleasure and fishing watercraft in the area here. Um, the lakes in this area on the border between Canada and the US are very popular for uh, fishing. Um, when we went up there to do the inspection, we crossed the border and just saw billboards everywhere, you know, fishing competition coming up. Uh, it's an interesting area, um, but lots of boats going around, especially during the summer months. Um, something a little bit unique about this structure. So typically when we think of a movable bridge, it's normally in the down position to allow for vehicles to cross over and then it opens only when a boat comes along. Um, this one's a bit unique. So because it's a rail structure, it sees a, typically a few trains a day, um, but boats are always passing back and forth. So this bridge is actually normally in the open position and it will only close when a train's coming. It's all automated, train comes along, trips a sensor, bridge lowers down, train crosses. Uh, you know, hits another sensor and the bridge goes ahead and opens back up. So kind of unique in that perspective. Um, and then also just noting here that the bridge does remain in the down position during the winter months. So uh, it's a period, I think it runs from somewhere in November through, I believe it's late April. Um, they actually put some straight track on the bridge, leave it in the down position because obviously there's no boats out there when the lake's frozen over. All right. Um, so that's just a quick background on the project itself. Um, and next we'll take a look here at the project need. So AECOM was contacted by CN in, uh, I think it was the summer of 2018. Um, they were noticing some wear between some of the structural elements. So in the uh, plan view here on the left, you can see this is the lower left rotation point, the one directly under the counterweight. And if you look at the photos, so the one in the upper right, that would be the post under the counterweight. You can see there's some scraping that was occurring there. We've got bare steel exposed. And then it's a little bit harder to see in this other photo because they've got some paint and grease in there, um, but subsequent or kind of matching scraping occurring on the lifting truss itself. So these two steel elements, as the bridge opens, again, this counterweight post comes down and in and rests within the lifting truss. Um, and when that happens, the two elements were rubbing together. So you know, certainly not a good thing to have occurring. We have uh, steel structures that are wearing on one another. So AECOM was tasked initially with an inspection of the structure. So we went out there, um, we did a hands-on inspection of both the mechanical and the structural systems. Um, you know, it was the structure that was wearing, but we had a, a pretty good feeling that it was likely caused by something mechanical related, um, expecting that there was some misalignment leading to this. So in addition to that where um, that was indicated by CN that we found, we also found something on what's referred to as the upper link arm. So again, in the plan view here on the left, uh, have it circled in blue. It's that link, uh, kind of the top link of the parallelogram of the system that ties the tower to the top of the counterweight. And when we got up there on top of it, what we found was some deformed members. So you can see in the photo here in the middle, have circled, you can kind of see a little kink point there. And then the photo on the right would be the lacing under that. You can see that it's uh, bent several lacing bars. So what happened here, if I jump to the next slide, oh, sorry, no. Nope. Um, you can see there's a brown box in some of the peripheral of these photos. So at some point during the bridge's history, um, you know, they changed the balance on the span. They added heavier rails or did some other miscellaneous things to the structure and had a need to add additional counterweight. And one of those modifications was done via this box. So we're not sure exactly what's in it um, because there was no record of it, um, but we assume there's some additional counterweight in this. And when they did that, 
at some point, again, during the bridge's lifespan, they opened the bridge and this frame actually came in contact with that counterweight box. So currently the bridge is fully automated. It has limit switches that'll stop it um, short of hitting here, but you know, likely at some point before it was automated, um, the bridge overran by a bit and had a, a little bit of deformation here. So when we noticed that, um, we wanted to make sure that, you know, when it bent those elements, it wasn't throwing out the geometry of that parallelogram. Um, ultimately, everything needs to stay in a nice plane for the system to work properly and not lead to misalignment and things like we're seeing here uh, with that where those structural elements. So we suggested and CN accepted um, a 3D LIDAR scan. So AECOM survey group went up there, um, did a full 3D LIDAR survey of the bridge. Um, we did it in three positions. So the fully open position, the fully closed position, and then we did one somewhere in between. Um, and you know, really what we were looking for was, does this parallelogram remain planar throughout the range of motion or has the geometry possibly been thrown off because of the bending of these elements in the top? Um, you know, for anybody who hasn't worked with LiDAR before, it's a great technology, but it does present some challenges. So, you know, it's a pretty cool graphic that we have here that we got from it, from that full 3D point cloud. You can develop these graphics, um, but in terms of pulling the data that you need out of the model, it can be a little tricky. Um, you know, it's kind of up to the discretion of the CAD operator who's working in the model to pull, making sure that they're pulling the exact point that you want. And in our case, we were looking to pull um, information from the four rotation points on the structure. So there's pins at all four of those pivot points. Uh, you know, these pins are all lubricated to, to avoid wear within them. And because of that, there's grease buildup. So, you know, want to make sure we're not picking something that's a glob of grease rather than the steel pin itself. And then some of these pins actually have holes bored through the middle of them um, to help accommodate the original construction. But again, you know, if we told the CAD operator to pick a point in the middle of the pin, they might be picking a point somewhere inside the hole rather than on the face. Um, so a couple of interesting challenges we ran into there. Um, we ended up, you know, picking a few points at the top and bottom fibers of the pin and averaging them to make sure we had confidence in the information we gathered. And then ultimately the outcome was um, we found that 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 parallelogram was remaining planar throughout the range of motion. The bent upper link members weren't causing any issues with the structure. And then ultimately, um, we determined that the wear um, between those two structural elements was actually linked to wear within the counterweight trunnion bushings. So that's that rotation point under the counterweight um, that has a bronze bushing in it. So with that determined, uh, next up was uh, design of the rehabilitation. So first up, a few construction constraints. So I mentioned we've got this causeway coming out here that much of the rail is on. Um, so there's a truss bridge here, and then the Rainy Lake Bridge of interest uh, out here that's circled in blue. So this site was only accessible via rail. So that meant that you know not only did the workers have to go out there via rail every morning, um, but also any equipment or uh, materials had to be taken out by rail. So you know, traveling out here a couple miles every day to the site, it all takes a little bit of time um, and it kind of complicates uh, what type of equipment and materials we can get out there. Um, you might be thinking to yourself, well, why couldn't you just take it out there via barge? Um, so I mentioned we were contacted in the summer of 2018 and once we determined what the brute cause was, CN wanted to get out and repair this thing quickly and do it over the winter shutdown when the bridge could remain closed um, so that we weren't impacting, um, you know, the ability to open this thing up for boat traffic. So we had a, a limited window to do the design, but also they had a limited winter window during the winter to do construction when the lake would be frozen over. So no ability to get anything in there by barge. Um, another one of the the uh, constraint for construction was some limited laydown areas. So in the zoomed in view here on the left, um, you can see you know there is some green areas adjacent to the track, but one, it's not much. And two, we'll see some photos later in the construction um, where there's actually some decent grades here. So there weren't nice flat areas to lay things down. So we had to work carefully to make sure we could identify some good areas uh, for the contractor to lay the materials down. And then the last key constraint is that we needed to maintain rail traffic throughout construction. So again, construction was going to be during the winter months when the bridge could remain in the closed position, didn't have to worry about boats, um, but we couldn't be interfering with the uh, 
the rail envelope so they could maintain traffic um, of those trains throughout the project. All right, um, so the, the main thing that we were looking to do here is replace this counterweight bushing. So uh, I put a blue circle here. So we've got this, uh, it's large casting. Um, again, this is a trunnion. So uh, the base of the casting is actually on the top just because of the orientation of the, the counterweight post and the load coming in from the top. Um, and then there's a brass bushing, kind of a liner, or sorry, bronze bushing on the inside here. And then there's a steel sleeve that goes through the middle and that bronze creates that uh, low friction surface um, that also avoids wear. All right, so, you know, at first glance, you know, replacing a bronze bushing, yes, it's big. Uh, I forget the exact size here, but it was something like 16, 18 inches, I believe. Um, but other than that, you think, oh, you swap out a bronze bushing, not that difficult. But when you step back and think about it, um, you know, obviously that bronze bushing is there for a reason, and it's carrying the load from the counterweight into the lifting truss. So we had a little bit over a million pounds in that counterweight, uh, about 1,100 kips. So to do any work on this trunnion itself, we had to remove that force from it so we could pull it out and replace that bushing. All right, so most of this uh, presentation, or the design rather, is gonna be focused on that structural aspect. So again, we've got a 1,100 pound, uh, 1,100 kip counterweight needs to be supported uh, to allow that bushing to be replaced. Um, so like I said earlier, work was going to be performed over the winter months. Um, th that way they could, uh, or sorry, the work was going to be performed over the winter months. Uh, therefore, it limited the ability to install new foundations, you know, limited construction duration, again, working with frozen over water. And you can see here that it's also pretty congested around here. So putting new foundations in, um, to support the counterweight temporarily wasn't really an option. So when we went out there to do our site visit over the summer months, one of the things we were really looking for, in addition to figuring out what was causing the problem, um, we had a pretty good feeling that it was going to require um, replacement of some of these mechanical components, and therefore we knew that we'd likely be having to support the counterweight. So one of the key things I was looking to do during that site visit was figure out what other means did we have of supporting the counterweight during construction if we weren't going to install any new foundations? So what we ended up identifying was uh, one of these struts. So you can see it here circled in blue. Um, there's a triangular strut which doesn't carry any gravity loads. It's really just providing stability to the main tower. Um, so it's riveted to the main tower and then it ties back into the abutment back here on the right side of things. All right, um, so again, we needed a, a system to get the load from the counterweight above, and we wanted to try to get it down to the existing foundations, avoid the need for any new foundations. So what we did, um, again, we have these counterweight post struts. There's one on the outside here, um, and then there was also one on the inside of the lifting truss. We didn't want to use the one on the inside because that was getting close to our rail envelope for live load, could impact rail operations. So we selected the one on the outside. Um, and then we came up with this system to carry the load from the counterweight down to those substructures. So we'll, we'll walk through that here. So first up, we have the existing strut here. So wanted to go ahead and remove that element. Again, it was riveted to the, the main um, tower for the the uh, pier, and then it was also connected back on the abutment side of things. Getting a little bit of feedback on my audio. If everyone could check and make sure they're muted, I'd appreciate it. Um, so first up, we had to pull that out of there, and then again, we're looking to carry the load down to the existing foundation. So the load currently is all coming from the counterweight down into the lifting truss, and then this circle right here is the main trunnion. All the load from the movable span gets carried into the pier from that. So we know the pier had capacity to carry the load, and some of that load did go into the pier. Um, but you can see here the tower is very close to the abutment, so I think it was around 75% of the counterweight load actually ended up going into the abutment, uh, which currently wasn't seeing any of that load. So. Um, that is one of the things we had to check was to do some checks for the abutment itself. Um, we did a little bit of studying, uh, you know, when I was out there on site, we looked at the surrounding areas. There were lots of rock outcroppings, 
Um, and then we also worked with CN to get the microfiche for the original plans and shop drawings and information. Um, dug through all of that info and, and finally found some information on the plans indicating that it was a spread on rock. Um, and, and from that, we were able to, to figure out approximately what we thought it could load and determine that it could carry the additional load coming in from this temporary support. Um, so I got in a little tangent there, but again, removing the existing strut. Um, so we replaced it with a box beam. So on the tower side of things, we reused some of the existing rivet holes, replaced those with bolts. And the blown up view here on the left, I believe um, the open holes were existing holes. And then the solid ones seen down here were some additional bolts just to get the capacity we needed on that right side. Um, and then back at the abutment, uh, we just more or less reused the, the plan area um, that was used for the existing strut to carry that load into the abutment. Uh, so the box beam itself, we designed it as a pair of W shapes with most of the, the flanges stripped off. Um, so we, we left a little bit of them to remain. In the image here on the right, you can see where it bared back at the abutment. We, again, were attempting to reuse those existing anchor bolts. So we left the flange there to make that connection, but otherwise assumed they would strip the flanges. And this was mainly for constructability. Um, installing stiffeners inside of a closed box, if they're going to fabricate it as a closed box, um, is very tricky. And we thought this was likely going to be a little bit easier for the contractor to do, where they could install um, partial width stiffeners on the eye shape and then close the section up um, by welding the flanges together. And we'll see when we get into construction that they uh, actually went with an alternate, which is why I mentioned that. All right, so we have the box beam then carrying the loads down the foundations. Um, above that, we have some jacking boxes, which were designed by the contractor, um, as we would typically see. And then on top of that, we have our tower. So we had some um, W-shaped columns coming up, some angles lacing in between for stability. And then carrying the load from the counterweight up top here, we had four needle beams. So. I think these were a, a very beefy W14 section, four of them under the counterweight. And then on the image here on the left, uh, you can see those needle beams running under the counterweight. Um, you can see the bearing area that's hatched there. We had some hardwood blocking to help carry that load. Um, wanted to really get that as close to the um, towers as we could. Again, these were W14s, pretty shallow sections carrying a lot of weight. So we were trying to limit the moment as much as possible and carry most of this load through shear. Um, down into the columns. Um, and then also we had some knee braces here um, providing stability to this system um, while it supported the counterweight. All right. And then just one other note here. So we had these four needle beams. If we look a little bit closer, the two on the right, um, there was a little notch in the concrete because when it would sling, when it swings into the fully open position, the concrete counterweight actually pulls into the tower a bit. So there was a small notch in that um, to allow that to happen. And our needle beam, um, one of the flanges was outside of the, the concrete where we wanted it to bear. So we ended up putting some brackets on. Uh, you can see here it was a W14 shape that we stripped into a WT shape. Um, just to allow for full bearing and full sharing of the load onto these needle beams. All right. Um, and then lastly, so I mentioned um, for the abutment itself, again, we were going to be taking about 75% of the counterweight load to the abutment, which it wasn't currently seeing. And if we looked at the abutment itself, um, it wasn't in the best of condition. Um, you know, which wasn't a problem when these were only struts to stabilize the main tower. But when we're looking to put a significant amount of load in the abutment, um, this ball becomes a little bit more significant. So if you look at the details of it, um, again, this bridge was built back in 1913. So this was unreinforced concrete. And if you look at the details, it wasn't very surprising that it's balled off. Um, we have this area right here, which hopefully everyone can see my cursor. I think you should be able to. Um, but it's denoted two foot seven inch lifting truss. So when the bridge opens and closes, there's a portion of the span that swings through here, which is why this notch was required. And then to the right of that, um, there's kind of a, a chunk of concrete hanging out there by itself. And again, unreinforced in the existing condition. So, you know, moisture would sit on this abutment cap, get in here, and over time it's spalled that chunk of concrete off. So one of the things we had to do it was uh, prescribed some concrete repairs, dealt some bars in, reinforced it, 
um, and had that built back up so that we could bear our, our beams onto it. All right, so again, I mentioned that we believe that the uh, wear that was occurring was due to wear in these trunnion bushings down below, um, but the upper link arm, you know, we have the two other pivot points up there. So in a theoretical condition, um, these upper link pivots shouldn't really be carrying any load. Um, so that's why they're at much smaller pin. You see here, I think they were about four inch diameter pins. But again, over a hundred year service life, we expected there was likely somewhere in these pins and kind of more uh, pertinent to our decision to rehabilitate these was the fact that, um, you know, currently the bridge is manually lubricated. Every time it operates, it pushes grease out to lubricate all of these pivot points. But over the lifespan of the structure, you know, when it was manually lubricated, it's likely that there were some periods of time where it might not have gotten regular lubrication, and especially these two upper pivot points. Um, to get up there is a little bit challenging. Got to use some ladders, climb on top of the counterweight, and then the one out by the tower um, would be particularly tricky to get to. So, you know, again, we felt it was probably likely that at some point it didn't get lubricated um, as well as it should have, and therefore these pivot points might have been seeing some wear. So, while we were supporting counterweight, it really made sense to go ahead and rehabilitate those, make sure that we're getting a good service life out of the structure moving forward. All right, so just a little bit more theory behind that. So technically, this upper link should be a zero force member. Um, if everything's designed and detailed, you know, perfectly, this counterweight is centered directly over the counterweight post. All of your load is vertical, and therefore there, there should be no load in this upper link. Um, you know, obviously you need something there because any any uh, imbalance would cause the thing to fall down otherwise. Um, and so there's there's two purposes for the link. One is to obviously provide that stability. Two, any wind loads applied to the counterweight itself would have to get transferred through this upper link. Um, and then there's actually a third one. So again, I mentioned there's this box on top of the counterweight, um, which we believe has additional ballast in it. And this is on the back side of the counterweight. So there's a likelihood that the, the balance isn't perfectly over the post at this point. It's leaning a little bit on the back side. Um, so we expect that there was some tension carried across this strut um, in a normal condition. And therefore, if we're going to pull these pins out, I uh, want to make sure that we're, we're holding that load there and not allowing it to rotate back and distribute um, uneven loads on the needle beams. So we came up with a concept of supporting that um, pretty basic. So we had some chains wrapped around it um, with some chain binders to pull it tight. Um, so on top of the counterweight, the excuse me, counterweight post comes up out of the counterweight, wrap around that at the tower side, go around the top of the tower, pull it tight, and then we can relieve the force in these pins, pop them out, rehabilitate them, put it all back together. Um, so just a pretty simple method of supporting it during construction. Um, and there's also a note here, so, you know, kind of these details you need to keep in mind when you're working on movable bridges. So we were planning to jack the counterweight to remove the load from the trunnion underneath. Um, so, you know, we were expecting that there would be a little bit of rebound from the span as we jacked, and we didn't know how high it was going to have to go to pull that load off it. Um, and during our inspection, we noted that there was a minimal gap between the, the link and the tower here. So just one of those things that we included in the plans for the counterweight, uh, or sorry, for the contractor to monitor that during construction and if needed, trim the steel to make sure we didn't bind it and cause any damage. All right, so that's the design side of things. And now we'll just run through uh, construction of the project. So, um, the project was awarded to Sacchetti Construction Limited. It was a contractor out of Canada. They had done a, a number of projects for CN. They were very familiar with working on and around the railroad, which was a, a major benefit. Um, they did a great job on this project, I'll say. Um, and construction began in mid-February 2019. So as I mentioned, inspection was summer 2018, designed uh, in the fall there, and then until we got it uh, advertised and they selected the contractor and they were able to mow out there. Um, they got out there in mid-February of 2019. Right, so the first thing for construction was removing these existing struts. So, you know, those came out pretty easy. Remove the rivets in the tower side, um, loosen the bolts for the anchor bolts and pull it out. 
Um, but one of the things they found is that although from our inspection, these anchor bolts appeared to be in relatively good condition, um, they found that they weren't in the best of condition. Uh, a couple of them, when they tried to remove the nuts, they actually broke the anchor bolt off. Um, they found that they had some section loss down at the interface with the concrete, and a few of them, when they tried to remove the nuts, um, the bolt the anchor bolt was actually just spinning in the concrete, um, so they weren't able to get the nut off. So we weren't planning on replacing these anchor bolts, but based on the condition they found, um, they did go ahead and, and get a change order to replace those anchor bolts. Um, and then another thing here, so again, we're right on the Minnesota-Canada border, right in the middle of winter, and we're having them one do construction, but also do concrete spall repairs. Um, obviously, it's very cold up there. It was interesting getting the weekly site reports. Uh, they'd come in in Celsius degrees, I'd have to convert them over, but there were a few weeks there that the highs were single digits. Uh, the lows overnight were about negative 20 to negative 30 with 10 to 15 mile an hour winds. So brutally cold, um, You know, obviously very difficult to even work in that condition, but certainly needed some containment to allow them to do this uh, concrete repairs on the abutment, which is what's shown here on the right is that containment and heat. All right, so as I mentioned, um, based on the condition of the anchor bolts that they discovered, they went ahead and replaced those. So they cored the, <clears throat> excuse me, cored the existing ones out and installed some new ones. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we had prescribed just kind of wrapping chains around here with chain binders and tightening it up. Uh, the contractor elected to use some threaded rods, so they cored through a couple of elements here on the tower. Um, <clears throat> they bared it on the tower on one side, um, and they used some blocking on the other side around the counterweight post coming out of the top of the counterweight, and then used some jacks to tension it. So it was a, a good alternate to what we had prescribed, and it worked well for them. And then on the right side here, so when we were going through design, we had these four needle beams and two of them were going to be within this opening under the counterweight. So we did some geometry on it. We checked it in CAD to make sure that they could be threaded in there. Um, but the contractor, when they got out there, they took a look at it and said, you know, yes, although it could be done, we think it's easier to actually pull off this uh, knee brace under the counterweight to get them in there a bit easier just on the one side. So something we reviewed made sure it wouldn't cause any issues with the structure and um, allowed them to do. So on the right there, they were working on uh, removing some of those rivets and replacing with bolts um, just to be ready to pull that element off when they needed to. All right. So next here, um, the area is under the box beams. Um, they actually ended up chipping them out a little bit and placing uh, a level pad just to make sure we had good bearing under the beams. Um, interesting photo here on the left, the contractor sent this along. So this was just noting the size of some of the aggregate in this concrete. Again, this was uh, mass concrete poured back in 19, early 1900s, um, unreinforced. So there were some just big chunks of rock that were thrown into the concrete um, that they pulled out when they did this uh, demo work. <clears throat> And then on the right here is a photo of the box beam that they ended up installing. So as I alluded to earlier, um, they actually went with a fabricated box rather than using W shapes and molding them together. Um, ended up with some unique methods, as I said, of installing those stiffeners where they actually cut holes in the top flange to weld stiffener and connect it uh, structurally to the top flange. Um, so in our opinion, was gonna be a little bit more tricky, but based on the fabricator they brought on board, that's the route they elected to take and it all worked out well. Um, and then again, the photo here on the right, they had that beam installed. Um, so from there, they had the beam up and they could erect the towers coming up uh, and put that beam across the top of the tower. And then we had the needle beams threading under the counterweight from there. Um, so you can see here, we've got the four needle beams in the center photo. Um, we had prescribed bolted connections for these knee braces. We were assuming that, that was gonna be easier. Um, one, it was gonna be overhead welding if they had to weld it. And two, again, very cold environment, middle of winter. Um, so they initially started to fabricate, assuming bolted connections, and they came back and said, hey, you know, we think we can weld these and do it faster and easier. Um, is that a problem? And you know, we looked at it and said, no, if you can do it, it's fine. Um, but that's why you see here, there's some bolt holes in the needle beam, but then the connection plate's actually welded to the beam. So they didn't end up using those holes. 
Um, and then on the right here, you can see that they've installed the knee braces. Um, those were bolted in place. And um, that's actually something that when we worked through the sequence, we wanted to make sure that these knee braces weren't taking on gravity loads. Again, counterweights, very heavy loads coming right in um, near the ends of these needle beams, and we didn't want to be jacking force into our knee braces. So we prescribed a sequence where they jacked the load from the towers into the into the counterweight, uh, lifted it up, and then went ahead and tightened the bolts for the knee braces to make sure that those were only providing stability and resisting any wind loads. All right, so here we've got um, on the left, we got a photo of their jacking box and they're going ahead and lifting up the counterweight, um, working on getting in the middle photo, getting those knee braces tightened up once they were lifted. And one of the things they had to do before they jacked it was remove the cap. So, you know, we didn't want to be trying to lift the uh, lifting truss up. We wanted to make sure that we were just jacking to displacement, jacking until we had zero force in the trunnion itself. So on the fight right there is a photo of one of the caps that they pulled off so they could check that displacement and uh, ensure that they knew when they had lift off. Um, so you'll see the condition of that cap. This was again a bronze bushing. Um, you know, the, the grooves that you can see here, these X patterns uh, don't show any significant wear. But we would expect this, right? Uh, the load's coming in from the top of the trunnion, so this cap is really just there to cover the the uh, the bearing sleeve, keep it out of the weather, make sure it's staying well lubricated, but it actually sees no force um, between the cap and the bushing itself. All right, and then this is a little bit out of sequence, but that's because they how it's how they did the work. So they were working on the upper link pins, kind of coincident with the lower, just to stay on schedule here. So these upper pins, like I said, they're uh, four inch diameter steel pins. We prescribe new pins, but maintaining the existing bronze bushings. So the photo in the middle is once they pulled the pin out, they went ahead and cleaned it. Um, but you can see that there is some scoring in there. And then the photo on the right is the same bronze bushing that they've gone ahead and um, they didn't turn it, but they just uh, refinished the surface by honing it. So clean that up, clean the grease grooves, grease grooves out, uh, made sure it was getting proper lubrication. And then uh, they measured these and um, turned new pins that were an appropriate diameter to make sure we had a good uh, clearance. All right, and then next year, so like I said, they jacked the counterweight. They had no load remaining in this trunnion. They pulled the cap off. Um, and you, so there's this sleeve. Um, it's, a, it's actually a steel cylinder, has a, a hole in the middle. I think it was about eight inches for this bridge. So you'd think, uh, you can kind of see here, there's a nut on this pin. You know, take this nut off and you pop the pin out. Easy enough. Everything comes apart. Um, so that's not actually how movable bridges are put together. So this pin, you want to make sure that it does not rotate relative to one, the lifting truss, or two, this steel sleeve here. So it's actually detailed with what they refer to as an interference fit. That means that your pin itself is actually larger than the hole it goes into. Um, so with that, you know, you can't just pull it out. It's, it's kind of clamped in there by its own residual force. And therefore, there's kind of two ways to remove them. One, you can try to drill right through the pin to remove it that way, or what the contractor elected to do was actually use a, a wire rope saw and they cut um, right between the lifting truss here and the trunnion itself. They cut right through, and that's what we see on the right here. They've cut through that pin and dropped this sleeve out um, with the pin still intact inside of it. And the middle photo is the, the bearing base coming out once that pin was cut free. So once they did that, um, photos in the left and right, there are these thrust plates in here. Um, so this is if the bridge wants to shift sideways, the bronze bushing has a shoulder on it and it runs against this thrust plate. So um, we had already prescribed new thrust plates, but they also got kind of eaten away with the wire rope sawing that they performed here. So those were replaced. And then in the middle, you can see they're doing machining on that new sleeve. So again, it's got about an eight inch diameter hole right through the middle of it where the pin goes. And then the sleeve itself uh, connects to the lifting truss, and then the bronze bushing comes in and rides on the outside of that sleeve. All right, so one thing we didn't expect here is we were planning to reuse the um, the casting for the base of that bearing as well as the cap. Um, you know, based on our inspection, 
excuse me, based on our inspection, it didn't show any signs of distress, appeared to be in relatively good condition. Um, so we were planning to just machine the inside of it to receive the new bronze bushing, clean it up, put it back together, and put it back into service. So they removed this, they took it back to the shop, and they sandblasted it to clean it up. They were getting ready to machine the inside face to receive the new bronze bushing, and they started to see some cracks showing up. So for instance, here on the left, we see we've got a crack on this outside corner. Um, so they reported it, we took a look at it, and we recommended doing some mag particle testing um, to see what the extents of the cracks were. And when they did that, um, cracks started popping up all over the place. So you can see here, all these yellow chalk circles are cracks that they identified. Uh, photo here on the right with UV light. You can see this is the right in the middle of that casting where most of the loads coming across. There's a big crack going across it. Uh, photo in the middle here is one of those inside surfaces where it uh, where the bronze sits in and that had what they refer to as map cracking. So kind of like spider web cracking all over the faces of them. Um, you know, obviously cracks are a bad thing when we're talking about steel. So we had this testing done. We we read through the report on it. We you know, considered all the possible causes. And ultimately what we determined is that these cracks were likely there from the original casting, from the cooling, um, or appeared shortly thereafter. So they weren't necessarily, you know, they're not fatigue cracks. Um, if we jump next slide here. So this trunnion, the counterweight's always sitting on top of it. Even when the bridge opens and closes, it doesn't see a stress cycle because the counterweight load is consistent because the counterweight's always perpend or always vertical. So, you know, we weren't really concerned about the crack growing due to fatigue because there's no there's no driver of fatigue within the casting. But, you know, obviously when we find cracks in steel elements, it's not a good thing. So we did recommend to CN to replace the castings and CN accepted that. Um, did cause a little bit of delay to the schedule because trying to fabricate these things in short order, get them out there and installed was a challenge. So, um, you know, we had a limited amount of time and had to come up with a concept for how to replace this. So we came up with four options that we looked into. One was a new casting. So pretty much take the existing one. They could make a mold of it, cast a new one, machine it, take it out and replace it. It'd be essentially the same as the one that was out there previously that had the cracks. So we contacted a few of uh, places that do this type of casting. There aren't a ton of them around anymore, um, but they told us that lead time at that point was likely six months minimum, potentially several months longer. So that just wasn't reasonable. That would mean shutting down the bridge for the entire navigation season. So that one was ruled out pretty quickly. Uh, weldment would be kind of replicating the existing with build up steel elements. So those ribs would be replaced with steel plates, weld everything together. Um, but again, the lead time on that significant because we not only have to design it for all those welds, um, prepare drawings, and then fabrication also isn't quick. So again, was going to be a very long lead time item. So we pretty quickly narrowed it down to two possible alternatives. So this thing, uh, you can see here on the right, the entire um, element is 16 and a quarter inches thick. So we were initially of the opinion that finding a piece of plate steel, you know, did they even roll it, which we found out they did, but trying to find it in short order, a uh, piece of plate that was 18 inches thick so that they could machine down was going to be challenging. So we tried to come up with some alternates. One of them was, you know, we thought about taking several steel plates, laminating them together, ranging in thickness um, to make something up to this 16 and a quarter inches thick and then machining that down from a solid block. Um, we coordinated with the contractor and they went back through their machine shops and they said, hey, you know, we actually found some 18 inch thick solid plate. We can just machine it out of one chunk of steel um, and do it quickly, which was great. Um, it worked out very well. Um, you know, this is quite a bit heavier than the existing casting that was out there, which had all the ribs and open space. But, you know, we're talking about differences of a few hundred pounds relative to a counterweight that weighs a million pounds. It's really not significant to the structure. Um, and yeah, this is what we ended up with. So we, we quickly developed some drawings for this new element. You can see here on the right, what it ended up as. Again, it's pretty much a big block of steel that was just machined to receive the new bronze bushings. Uh, we have some holes here for the grease to get into the, the bushing itself. Um, but otherwise, it's a big hunk of steel. And then the cap we actually maintained. So although the cap did have some cracking in it as well, again, the cap sees no load. It's really there just to keep the dirt and weather off of the sleeve itself. So we uh, machined the, the face to receive the new bronze bushing and reuse the cap itself. 
All right, so once those were fabricated, um, the new base is up here in place. There's the new sleeve, which is, or sorry, then there's the bronze bushing that goes in. There's the steel sleeve that has the big hole in it. And then there's the pin that needs to go through the sleeve. So you need everything to be perfectly aligned so that we can get this interference fit and the pin goes in there and lines everything up perfectly. So they actually leave some extra meat on all these elements. We put them in place and then they come in and they do what's referred to as a line boring operation. So they actually drill the, the final hole diameter in place with everything installed. Um, this was one of the few things on the project where they did have to get a rail closure for a, a number of hours because we don't want the span bumping up and down and causing the heel here to move around while they're trying to do this uh, very precise boring. So there were some closures to the rail line for a few hours that had to be coordinated. But as I said, the, this line typically only saw a few trains a day, so that wasn't too difficult to coordinate. Um, and then kind of the last thing here is installing the pin itself. So again, the pin's a interference fit. The pin's larger than the hole. So the way that you get that in there is by cooling the pin. So you can see here they built a little cooler on site. Um, they filled this with a mixture of alcohol and dry ice. Um, very cold. You dip the pin in and it cools it down such that it actually gets smaller than the hole it has to go into. Um, and then you pull it out of there and get it through that hole. And this is one of the more uh, intense things you see on a movable bridge site. You have a limited window here to get that thing in there because if you get it part way in and it heats up too much, all of a sudden it's clamped in place and you can't move it. And that's a very bad thing because then you have to hydraulically remove it. And when you pull it out, it, it cold works the surfaces, it tears the steel. And at that point, you more or less have to start back at square one with redrilling your hole, machining a new pin and starting over. So that's uh, pretty much everything I've got. Uh, last thing I have here is a video, if it works, of this pin going in, which is kind of neat. Uh, I think it's about seven or eight minutes long. So um, if this works, I'll go ahead and play it. But um, while that's playing, it can certainly take some questions as well. Uh, yeah, we've got we've got a little bit of time. Commentary um, while it's running, unless there's any questions. So, uh, true to its name, Rainy Lake. It was raining on the day they were trying to do this, um, so not the best weather conditions. Uh, as I said, the pins in a, a bat of alcohol and dry ice cool it down um, very cold to reduce that diameter, and then once the again once they lift this thing out of the, the bath that. The clock starts ticking and they've got limited time to do it, so it gets a little bit intense. You can see they've already got a rod sticking through there, so there's a hole in the pin itself, um, and they have a hydraulic jack on the opposite side, so once they get it lifted up into place, they'll slip that rod through and get a nut on the other side, and they can physically pull it through, um, make sure it seats well. Hey, John, can you hear me? Um, a question about the, the pin material. Did you have to match the original material that was there or did you use um, a more modern steel? For the pin itself, it was a modern steel. Um, yeah, that wasn't really critical to match the existing. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a modern steel. I don't recall offhand exactly what it was. And again, because it was raining and this thing's at, uh, well, I'm not certain what the temperature is for dry ice, but well below freezing as it was raining, the, the rainwater was freezing on the pin, frosting up. And then, so they've got it out of the, the bath at this point, starting to heat up. Um, might wonder what the heck that guy's doing that they're standing around. So he's actually in there with a micrometer, checking the diameter to make sure that it's provided clearance, um, you know, that it's smaller than the hole that it's going into. The last thing you want to do is to try to start installing this thing and find out that it had little to no clearance and get it stuck. Uh, 
uh, John, I got one question coming on the chat that says, um, has the where issue noted been confirmed to be resolved post construction? Did this fix the problem? It did. Yeah, so we um, we obviously realigned everything, got it where it needed to be, installed these new bronze bushings. Um, we put a little bit of extra meat on the shoulders of the bronze bushings to keep it away from the side where it was rubbing currently, just a kind of belt and suspenders approach. Um, and then there were there were a few rivet heads that had to be ground down a little bit just to allow it to slide. But yeah, we we've got good clearance on that side where it was binding and wearing currently or previously, I should say. So would they, have, would they have used a liquid nitrogen bath in 1913 when they built it? Uh, this was not liquid nitrogen. This was dry ice. Liquid nitrogen is much colder. Um, but yeah, when they originally built this, they would have used a, a similar method of cooling and or heating. Um, so the other thing you can do is cool the pin and heat the steel itself to make that enlarge. And uh, if you caught it there, um, after he took that measurement, he said 11 thou, that's 11 thousandths of an inch of clearance that they've indicated they have. So again, pretty small measurements, but they do have clearance there to get it in. All right, John, another question. Um, any lessons learned or things that you would do differently? You got to do it again. I, I think the biggest lesson learned was with those castings. Um, again, we had no indications. The the cracks that were present, you know, although some of them could be seen by eye, they were all covered with several coats of paint. So although we had no way of knowing, I think if we were doing it again with a, a similar vintage bridge, we'd probably go ahead and prescribe replacement of those housings just to make sure you didn't run into issues during construction that might impact your schedule um, otherwise you know i think the, the structural system we use worked out great um, didn't have any issues with that it went pretty smoothly and like i said it kind of provided an elegant solution to avoid the need for foundation which was very beneficial to getting this thing done in the time constraints we had So they uh, installed part of it. They could push it partway in by hand. And then the other side, they've got a hydraulic ram or cylinder. It's going to pull it into the final position. So they're getting some nuts on this side so they can pull that. And then uh, the, the guy taking the video here was a mechanical engineer for AECOM up in Canada. He did a, a lot of the site work for us. And he's going to run around to the other side here. Um, and the contractor uh, should have had the nuts on the other side already, but you can see they're a little bit frantic. They realized they didn't. Um, so again, tight time constraints. Getting everything on there and then I'll go ahead and pull that right into place, see that. All right, and that's it. So it's seated and then just go ahead and they'll, uh, they'll let it sit there until it warms up and everything's good to go. Put the nut on and, and they'll be done. John, I missed it. Was this done on both sides of the bridge or just on the one where the rubbing was? No, so we did it on both, you know, assuming that uh, if they were having issues on one side, there was no reason that it likely hadn't worn similarly on the other side. So we did both. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you, John. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, one last question that came, came in. Uh, do you have, do you know what the construction cost was for this? Yeah, so it was bid just under a million Canadian dollars. Um, 
and I don't recall offhand what the change orders were. The, the main one was the replacement of that casting. Um, the other ones for the anchor bolts, those were minimal. I want to say it was on the order of 100 to 200,000 for those new um, machined trunnions, but I don't recall offhand exactly what that was. Was the casting replacement stainless or regular steel? Uh, it was just an A36 plate, so regular steel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you probably saw in the photos there that it was uh, bare steel exposed. They didn't paint it before it came to site. I'm not sure why, um, but it quickly got painted while it was on site to make sure it didn't corrode. Okay. Uh, what was the reason to change the box fabrication? Um, was it cost related? I'm not certain, to be honest, why the, the contractor elected to do it that way. I'm not sure if they couldn't get the wide flange section to be prescribed or they just felt it was cheaper to fabricate as a box from plate. Um, but they determined that, that was a better means. They also, um, if I run back up here, they made one other change. We had prescribed stripping the flanges fully and then boring and threading to get the jacking boxes bolted down to the beam. You can see on the outboard side, they actually left some of this flange out here and they bolted through uh, versus on the inside they drilled and tapped. So that was another small change. That, um, they just felt it was a bit easier for them to do that way. Okay. Um, and back to the pin, the pin material, what was the material used for the pin? I would have to go back and look. I don't recall offhand. It was a yeah, it's more of a mechanical item um, that I could look up, but I don't recall offhand what the ASTM designation was. Okay. Well, thank you, John. Um, you get the award for getting as close to the end of the time for the meeting, right exactly at one o'clock. <laughs> uh, also, a uh, very interesting project, quickly uh, uh, and structurally. I appreciate you putting that together for us. So uh, thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm going to take the screen back uh, just to close out everybody. Um, uh, thank you all for attending today. If you have any follow up questions, please do feel free to reach out. Um, <clears throat> our uh, of, uh, January 20th um, registry repairs, the Hernando de Soto Bridge, uh, be given by our own uh, SCI Philly board member, uh, Greg Dunn. Uh, in February, we have um, a joint meeting with DBGI for landside stabilization of the I-95 express tolls. Um, and then uh, dates to be finalized in, in March, we have uh, bridge architecture and aesthetics, uh, and in April 22, uh, with a joint meeting with ASC uh, Philadelphia, uh, we'll be doing uh, structural innovations at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, no one uh, did a, personally did a tour of that, and it was uh, really interesting, and uh, I think that's gonna be uh, a great meeting for us. And we'll have one more to close out in May, uh, we're still organizing that one. <clears throat> uh, finally, we are uh, going to be advertising our SCI annual scholarship uh, in December here and awarding it in February. Um, so if you have uh, um, anyone who may be interested, uh, a structural engineer in the Philadelphia University area, um, uh, they can uh, look out for that or uh, reach out to us. So we can help get them an application uh, for that award. With that, I uh, thank John again for uh, his time today and in, in preparation for today. I uh, also thank you all for joining us. I will see you next time. Right, thanks, James.